Well, hi everybody, this is Joe. Thank you for clicking on another George Eliot video. We are now in 1868. We're firmly in George Eliot's mid-career. Uh, Felix Holt the Radical has been published uh, the year previous. And I've got to tell you, we are now in the portion of George Eliot's career that I have been dreading uh, the most. I have been most intimidated by this portion of George Eliot's career. Since I started this series way back, what, a little over two years ago now, I, I've seen the tsunami coming. <laughs> I've seen the tidal wave coming. I can no longer dodge it. I can't avoid it. I can't stall any further. I might as well just uh, face, face it and uh, face it head on and read it and uh, discuss it on this video. But I, I will tell you, this has intimidated me because beginning in 1868, we're now in the portion of George Eliot's career where she is primarily focusing on poetry. Yeah, poetry. Uh, Middlemarch is still a good five years off. Uh, she, Felix Holt came out the year previous. She's really not writing very many essays for magazines the way she has in the past. She's pretty much done with that. We're now in poetry, and one of the first of the lot is this epic length poem uh, called The Spanish Gypsy. And yes, I've seen this coming, and it has intimidated me for a long time. The, the idea of just reading it and getting into it has scared me um, for really two primary reasons. One is just the form of it. I mean, it's this epic poetry of a form that I am not used to. I'm not a poetry reader, so I don't know how to assess it. I don't know how to read it for its literary merits. I'm not a poetry reader, so I just don't know how to approach this thing. I really wonder how the readers of 1868 approach this. This was published in Blackwood's magazine, same as all of her other novels. So yeah, I wonder how the audience of 1868 approached this, because it is largely forgotten about to a modern audience. And that, that that's the other primary reason this thing has intimidated me, the amount that it has, is that it's forgotten about. I mean, when you think of George Eliot, what do you think about? Uh, the, the pastoral novels, Adam Bede, uh, Middlemarch, Silas Marner, stuff like that. You don't think about epic poetry like this. Epic poetry that takes place in Inquisition-era Spain epic poetry that concerns uh, cultural and religious conflicts between Muslims, Jews, Christians, and gypsies on the Iberian Peninsula. <laughs> what? George Eliot? <laughs> you don't think about that. Couple that with the fact that uh, there are, to my knowledge, no modern reprints of George Eliot's poetry, much less just the Spanish gypsy. In existence, there are no modern reprints. You know, Barnes and Noble, Penguin Classics, no, nothing, nothing, no cheap reprints of this. Uh, I found a scholarly edition online that's modern, that's full of notes and annotations and appendices and things that you know explain all of this stuff that I'm reading, but um, I didn't get it. It's out of my price range and. Uh, you know, I want to approach this like a general reader, not a scholar, so I didn't get it. Uh, this reprint that I'm reading, it's a cheap reprint from that I found in a used bookstore from 1885. So you got to go back a ways to find some popular edition of this, of George Eliot's poetry. And when I say it's forgotten about to a modern audience, I mean forgotten. Uh, you can't find not only a modern reprint of this in Barnes & Noble, or in your, you know, your local bookstore. You can't find a free edition online from Project Gutenberg or any other source that I can find, uh, you know, outside of just a, a, a page scan on archive.org or George Eliot Archive or something like that. You can't find it on Gutenberg. You can't find it read aloud to you on LibriVox. You cannot even find a Wikipedia article on the Spanish Gypsy, despite its length. This thing is a, it's novel length. You can't even find a Wikipedia article on this. So I'm, I'm looking at this thing going, my God, either the Spanish Gypsy 
is impenetrable and cannot be, you know, understood because nobody's writing about it or re it's not being reprinted, or it just might flat out suck and <laughs> nobody wants to touch it. <laughs> so all of these things have really intimidated me. Okay, so with all that said, um, I do, however, find it surprising that despite its obscurity to a modern audience, it is, uh, by contrast, the most heavily annotated or had the longest gestation period of any of George Eliot's novels up to this point. I mean, when you look at the, uh, at the letters that George Eliot was writing and the uh, journal entries that she's putting in there, she's writing a lot about the process of writing the Spanish Gypsy, as opposed to any of her other novels. I mean, when you read her journal entries for, let's say, anything else, Felix Holt the Radical, I mean, there's next to nothing about the writing process of Felix Holt the Radical or, or um, Romola. There's a little bit more on Romola, but, you know, there's just, they're just breadcrumbs here and there. You just pick up hints. Mostly what her journal is talking about is, you know, what she's reading and vi friends she's visiting and theaters she's going to see. And she doesn't really talk about the process of writing so much until you get to the Spanish Gypsy. She writes a lot about the process of writing this and the length of time that she wrote this what I call the gestation period. She began writing The Spanish Gypsy around 1863 and 1864. Uh, she's inspired by several plays that she sees and she gets some ideas that she wants to, to flesh out. She begins it as a drama, um, as a stage play, to tell you the truth. Uh, she writes in her journal in 1864 that she learned Spanish, uh, you know, just as a side note. She learned Spanish, and she does this so that she can further her research into Spanish literature. Uh, I don't think she knows how to speak it. Uh, rather, she knows how to read it. She kind of taught herself how to, how to do that. Uh, and I'm sure she had lots of dictionaries at hand, but nonetheless, she learned how to speak Spanish, or not speak, but read Spanish just as a way to research the Spanish gypsy. She be begins it. The begins, begins the process of writing it as a stage production. And she works on that for about two years, and she's really not getting anywhere. Um, her husband, George Henry Lewis, tells her, hey, uh, <laughs> why don't you put this thing aside for a while? Let it simmer. Work on a, work on a, on a novel. I don't know, maybe write it about political violence or on the reform bill. <laughs> you know, something simple like that. And uh, come back to it in about a year. So that's what George Eliot does. She goes and writes Felix Holt the Radical, gets published in Blackwoods, and then comes back to, to the Spanish Gypsy, but completely restructures it as an epic poem. Uh, she tells her publisher, uh, John Blackwood, that she is planning her next novel to be based in Inquisition-era Spain, and uh, by the way, Mr. Blackwood, uh, brace yourself. It's going to be a poem. <laughs> but, but don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, my husband, uh, George Henry Lewis, is putting the muzzle on and keeping me from writing over uh, 9,000 lines. So don't panic. <laughs> I'll keep it short. And by the way, by the way, can you reprint this draft that I am submitting because it's a poem and as a poem I need to read it aloud to myself so that I can check the rhythm as I go. Um, so George Eliot is obsessing over the rhythmic structure of this poetry and I can tell you that she obsesses over it because uh, Mr. Blackwood, the publisher, prints out a draft of the Spanish Gypsy, gives it back to George Eliot so that she can read it and recite it to herself to check the rhythmic structure. But, 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 she goes to Spain on kind of a research trip. She goes to Spain and then writes in her journal that she's all kinds of, a, of disappointed because 
in her research, she's reading Spanish, and she assumes that, is, that it is pronounced a certain way that she includes in her poetry. But she's finding out these certain Spanish words, in particular, zincala and bedmar and, and place names like that, are pronounced differently <laughs> than she had thought. So <laughs> it jacks up the rhythm of her poetry. Oh, no. So she's got to go back and rewrite large chunks of the Spanish Gypsy to accommodate that, that rhythmic structure of the actual pronunciation of these Spanish words. Believe it or not, for that reason, there are at least two different versions of the Spanish Gypsy floating around. One before the the one before and one after the uh, pronunciation of Spanish words was kind of corrected. Um, so I get the impression that this draft version was leaked, I guess. But you can find both those versions on archive.org. I've looked. It's really amazing. So the the process of of writing this thing took about five years of going over, drafting, researching, changing format, uh, rewriting, <laughs> reciting to get the rhythm correct. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, George Eliot is obsessive. And I guess, I don't, I don't know, that's one of the reasons I'm so attracted to her as an author. It's that she's not content uh, to just rehash the old hits. I mean, she's not just writing... Uh, what made her successful over and over. She's not writing these bucolic uh, uh, pastoral novels like Adam Bede over and over and over and over again. Uh, she's branching out. She's progressing. She's trying new things. She's writing about uh, Renaissance era Florence, political violence. And now she's in Inquisition era Spain, writing about the clash of ancient religious cultures um, ambitious, fearless. Uh, that, that, uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the main reasons that, uh, that I'm so attracted to George Eliot as an author. I do believe by this point in her career that she, is, she has become fully uh, aware of her powers as a literary artist and her confidence really shows in that she is doing direct negotiations with her publisher, John Blackwood. Um, and she's trying all of these ambitious new things that she's never done before. She's going into uncharted territory all the time, fearlessly. She's not going to rehash the hits like some a 1970s rock band, <laughs> just replaying the same crap over and over and over uh, for, for years. She's trying new things all the time. I mean, contrast that with the person who published the first short story, the, uh, the uh, Sad Fortunes of Amos Barton. She wanted to be anonymous. She hid behind her husband as a literary agent and as somebody who could submit these stories for her. Um, compare that to the person that we have now doing direct negotiations with her publisher and doing all of these different things. So... Um, I love that. Amazing stuff. I do believe that in scope and in influence as a literary artist, George Eliot is quite literally trying to be William Shakespeare. Not in form. Not in form. This is nothing like Shakespeare, but I'm talking about in scope and influence. She's fully aware of who she is. Again, totally admirable. I love that. I love that about her. Well, let's, with all that aside now, let's talk a little bit about having now read the Spanish Gypsy um, twice. <laughs> Let's now read it. Because the Spanish Gypsy is pretty much like every other thing that I've read by George Eliot in that I can't just pick it up and just read it from page one. Uh, I kind of got to get a running start. Um, I will confess that because this is non-conversational writing uh, that George Eliot engages in, I, I, I kind of have to read a first few chapters and then I have to back up and restart and kind of get a running start. I need to get a little bit of momentum going. I really did this with the Spanish Gypsy. I read up through the about halfway through uh, to a key pivot 
moment in this poem and I had to re go back and just begin all over again. Uh, that's fine. This is the kind of, I know what I'm getting into when I get it going to George Eliot that I have to do this. But, you know, you have to do this when, when it's unlike anything George Eliot has, has written before. Let's talk about what makes this so different from all of her other novels. What are the characteristics of George Eliot's literature that she is known for? She's known for, let's say, uh, well, something I've already brought up. She's known for writing uh, stories about the English Midlands, pastoral stories of the English Midlands. Well, obviously, we're far from there. We are in Inquisition-era uh, Iberian Peninsula. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about gypsies uh, acquiring their own homeland in Africa, you know, a, a subject that is far away from the Midlands of England. Uh, George Eliot is also known about writing about the psychological depth of her characters. As I often say, there are no good guys or bad guys or, you know, cartoonish villains or anything like that in her novels. They're novels about people, real people with real situations that, um, that people difficult situations that people of the time often encounter and uh, you know they're timeless situations really when you think about it do we encounter that in this novel or pardon me in this poem the spanish gypsy uh not only no but hell no <laughs> we do not uh the characters in the spanish gypsy are stylized they are wholly unrealistic people put in unrealistic situations because this entire epic poem is metaphor. It is, it is, it is rhetoric. It is metaphor and it is done for a reason. That, that, that is why it is put in a poetic form. Uh, she couldn't get away with some of the situations that she puts her characters through in one of her novels because it's ridiculous. It would be ridiculous. Um, uh, there are really un, un, unrealistic situations that the, that the characters go through in this epic poem. But it's done for a reason. It's, it's poetry. She can get away with it, I suppose. So I guess now that I started that, well, let's go ahead and talk about the characters uh, in, this, in this epic poem. Um, it begins uh, by discussing the, well, we, we have an introduction, really. And it begins by setting the scene. We're in Iberian Spain. And we are kind of in the perimeter of the, the kind of the no man's land or the, the, the hinterland between Muslim and Christian. And we are in the town of Bedmar where uh, it is constantly being fought over. There are Christians there, but the architecture is Muslim, for instance. And it it's, it's one of these towns that is constantly being conquered, reconquered, and defended, and redefended by both Christian and Muslim. Currently, it's occupied by Christians, but just over that hill over there, there are the Muslims. They're encamping, and they may hold us, uh, they may hold this town under siege any day. But don't you worry, because we have the defender of the town of Bedmar. The defender is somebody named Duke Silva, or Don Silva, as he is called. The poem begins by talking about the heroic qualities of Don Silva. He is heroic. He is um, almost, he is virtuous. He is kind of like one of these, uh, one of like, like the Archangel Michael or one of these saintly knights of, of European history. You know, one of these people who are, who are turned into a saint retrospectively. Um, it's almost, he's almost described kind of like a, a, a Raphael type painting or a romantic type painting of Napoleon. You know, you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah, Napoleon on the horse. And he's just majestic and virtuous and unstoppable. You can trust him. What a glorious defender of, of our town and of the Christian faith in general. 
Well, that's how the poem begins, and that's how the town people view him as, even if the town people are Jewish and have to change their names and uh, profess a faith they don't actually believe in. They'll still say, oh yes, Don Silva, he is majestic, he is virtuous, he is a glorious defender of our town. But really, it's only in the opening pages of this poem in which he, Don Silva is described in that way. Because when we go into the bedchambers of Don Silva and we actually uh, see his life up front, we don't hear that description of him anymore, of being this, this majestic warrior and defender of Bedmar and the Christian religion. <laughs> He's somebody... <laughs> He is somebody who has this impetuous infatuation with a young Spanish peasant girl named Fedalma. Uh, well, it, it, is she a peasant girl? We'll, we'll get back to that. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, he, he has this fascination with this dark-haired beauty named Fedalma. Uh, she was raised by the Spanish and uh, Don Silva has known her all her life, and by golly, she is in love with her. My goodness, can't get his mind off of her. And conversely, she is in love with him. Fedalma loves these jewels that Don Silva presents to her as betrothal gifts. Oh my goodness, it's just, my, her heart is going a pitter, a patter. <laughs> Young Fedalma. But... But it's interesting in that she looks at these jewels that are presented to her as a betrothal gift. And in the poetry that is presented to her, you know, the, the, the metaphorical poetry that is being written, she looks and she gazes into this, the, the jewels and she sees souls in them. Human souls of history's past. Hmm, what can that mean? <laughs> so you can see that all of these different items uh, that, are, that are put into this poem, they've got to point to something else because we're looking at metaphor throughout this entire poem. Uh, George Eliot is not talking about human souls in gems just as a triviality. It's put in there for a reason. And I even put in my notes, in my, my notebook here, that, oh yeah, we're coming back to this human souls uh, soon. Uh, it's it's inevitable the way this is written. Sure enough, it does. Sure enough, it does. It turns out that um, uh, as as Faye Dalma is is looking at these gems, looking at these jewels, she turns her shoulder, and what do you know? There's a bunch of prisoners being paraded. What are they do? What are these prisoners doing in the betrothal chamber? Doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> That's what I mean by unrealistic situations. Characters pop in and out of these scenes for no logical reason. They're, they're idealized. They're, suddenly, Fedalma, almost like dreamlike, she's looking at these jewels and she turns around, looks over her shoulder, and sees prisoners in chains. My goodness, who are those prisoners? Don Silva replies, oh, those are the gypsies that we have enslaved, that we have captured. And by the way, we took these jewels from them. <laughs> and uh, so, oh, Fedalma gets it. And um, there's an amazing scene now. Now, with all that said, uh, well, let's talk about some other characters. So that's, that's the introduction to Fedalma and Don Silva. There's also some other characters, in particular, um, in the tavern. So Bedmar has a tavern where a lot of local people stay and they, 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 they talk about the politics of what's going on uh, just amongst themselves. It's very similar to the scenes in the barbershop in the novel uh, Romola where you have just people, um, you know, townspeople, local people, you know, just the riffraff, uh, street entertainers in this case. Uh, they're, they're just mingling and talking amongst themselves about what they think is going on in the town. It's kind of, kind of their perspective of Don Silva 
And for some reason, they know Faye Dalma also. And they think about the relationship that Don Silva has with uh, Faye Dalma. A lot of them don't think it's a good idea. Uh, a lot of them think that Don Silva is kind of marrying down uh, to this young, to this young, uh, this young beauty, this young Spanish beauty. Uh, there's also another character named Juan, who I find fascinating because Juan um, seems to know everybody. He pops in and out throughout this epic poem, having conversations with everybody about everything. He's kind of like, I would call him, uh, I would perhaps the narrator. In real life, is it, can this character exist? Can he, can he talk to the people in the tavern and then have private conversations with Faye Dalma and then have private conversations with Don Silva and then go to the, across the hinterlands into the Muslim camp and have conversations with the people over there? No, nah, I don't think so. But he's kind of like the interpreter of uh, between the characters in this poem and the reader. Found him very interesting. I'll, I'll come back to Juan here in a little bit uh, and talk a little bit more about him. But then the other main character in this, well, two more main characters in this novel uh, are Zarka and Father Isidore. Now, Zarka is... The <laughs> this is another uh, a, a well known uh, uh, a plot device that George Eliot has used in previous novels, and that is the mysterious parentage and the the mysterious um, um, inheritance of her characters. In this case of a Dalma, she thinks she's Spanish. She thinks she was raised in a Spanish family, but then she goes to uh, but then she meets one of the prisoners who she saw, a prisoner who had escaped. Well, this prisoner just shows up in her bedchamber all of a sudden one night, <laughs> and, and she recognizes him. Oh, you are the escaped prisoner. You are the escaped gypsy. Well, it turns out this guy is named Zarka, and he says, yes, I am the escaped gypsy. I am the escaped prisoner. By the way, all those betrothal jewels, they're mine. Uh, they were stolen from me. Oh, uh, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> uh, something else is going on. You are my daughter. Yes, you are my daughter. You are the Spanish gypsy being my daughter. And, and, and I am a leader of the gypsy people and you are to uh, and you are a spanish queen and and you have a fate you have a destiny you are not a mere uh, uh person who lives in, in in spanish in the spanish uh, region you are to lead the spanish or the the gypsy people to their to freedom to their homeland they are to be brought across the Mediterranean Sea to Africa, and you are to lead them as their queen. They need inspiration. They need leadership. They need cohesiveness. And you are the person to do that. Uh, <laughs> it's an amazing scene. Um, so let me read a little bit of that. When Fedalma finds out that she is a gypsy, from Zarka, uh, here's what she says uh, concerning the gypsy race. She says, I am a gypsy, a race that lives on prey as foxes do, with stealthy, petty rapine, so despised it is not persecuted, only spurned, crushed underfoot, warred on by chance like rats, or swarming flies, or reptiles of the sea, dragged in the net unsought and flung far off to perish as they may? Zarka responds, You paint us well. So abject are the men whose blood we share, untutored, unbefriended, unendowed, no favorites of heaven or of men. Therefore I cling to them, etc. So, Fedalma is astounded that she is a leader of these 
rudderless people who are despised, who have no religion, who have no home. Zarka charges Fedalma uh, with being kind of a messiah, with being a Moses, with leading the gypsy race to freedom. Here is what Zarka says to Fedalma. Uh, well, Fedalma says, say, what is my task? Zarka responds, to be the angel of a homeless tribe, to help me bless a race taught by no prophet, and make their name, now but a badge of scorn, a glorious banner floating in their midst, stirring the air they breathe with impulses of generous pride, exalting fellowship, until it soars to magnanimity. I'll guide my brethren forth to their new land, where they shall plant and sow and reap their own, serving each other's needs, and so be spurred to skill in all the arts that succor life. Where we may kindle our first altar fire from settled hearths, and call our holy place the hearth that binds us in one family. The land awaits them, they await their chief. Me, who am prisoned, all depends on you. My goodness. So, Vedalma, this is the first time hearing this. And how does she respond? She, she, it's, the text says, Vedalma, rising to her full height and looking solemnly at Zarka. Father, your child is ready. She will not forsake her kindred. She will brave all scorn, sooner than scorn herself. Let Spaniards, all, Christians, Jews, Moors, shoot out the lip and say, Lo, the first hero in a tribe of thieves, etc., etc. Amazing, amazing writing, powerful writing, thoroughly unrealistic. This is literally the idea of Moses being called uh, to lead his people to the promised land. And Zarka is just entering her bedchambers, a, you know, an escaped prisoner, announcing himself to be her father and charging her with the destiny of leading a despised race to a promised land in Africa. Um, in, this has been done in previous novels where characters find out that they have been um, they have been adopted from from uh, from from long forgotten parents this happened in Romola this happened in Silas Marner this happened in Felix Holt the Radical all of these novels where the character has been adopted and there's a mysterious uh, inheritance involved in all of those novels in particular Felix Holt the Radical George Eliot goes through lengthy contortions to, to describe the, the legal shenanigans by which this stuff could actually happen. Very realistic, obsessively realistic. In this, in the Spanish Gypsy, Fedalma finds out that she has this, <laughs> this almost Messiah-like charge placed on her. What would happen in Felix Holt the Radical? Well, you know, Fedalma would go about for a few chapters, trying to figure out if uh, the claims of this <laughs> escaped gypsy prisoner was actually true or not. But in this novel, instant conversion. She accepts the charge. She accepts everything that Zarka says as true. Again, unrealistic, powerfully written nonetheless. And I guess... I guess that is one of the reasons why you write this as epic poetry. I mean, it is biblical in approach. It is just as powerful as Moses being charged the, the, the destiny of leading the people to the promised land. Again, that also in Exodus, in the Bible, written in epic poetic form. Very similar. You couldn't get away with this in prose. And it's powerful. It is extremely powerful. I, this, this middle section where Fedalma receives her charge from Zarka is the most powerful portion of, 
of this entire poem. It's gripping. I couldn't, I couldn't pry my eyes off it. Well, inevitably, you know, I thought that, oh no, there's going to be, you know, Faye Dalma is going to have this, <clears throat> this um, conflict between going back and being with Do or with Don Silva and then to charge and then Don Silva is going to freak out and say, what's going on? Well, I, th I thought that's what was going to happen, but I forgot that this is not realistic. This is, <laughs> this is all stylized. What ends up happening in this poem is that Don Silva finds out that his betrothed wife is actually a gypsy. Uh, he doesn't freak out. He instead renounces his Spanish heritage. All that stuff that we read early on in this epic poem about pardon me, about him being this noble, virtuous defender of the Catholic faith. Uh, you know, even his horse is, is majestic and powerful and the armor and all of that's forgotten. We forgot, that's long behind. He's renounced his, his Spanish heritage. He renounces his Catholic faith. And he says that he will be ruled under by Zarca, this Spanish, or pardon me, this gypsy uh, prisoner who turns out to be a bit of a warlord. <laughs> he wants to take over the town of Bedmar in cooperation with the Moors or Muslims. So, uh, you know, Don Silva, he, he accepts his charge to be, you know, a foot soldier. Not really a foot soldier, but just a, basically a grunt. <laughs> so that he can be with his true love, Fay Dalma. He gives up everything. Contrast that with Fay Dalma. Fay Dalma, uh, she's in the gypsy camp and she talks to one of her, you know, one of her servants and says, you know, you are you are betrothed to a, to a young man named Ismail. What if Ismail was to leave his faith? Would you follow him and renounce your people? Or would you stay with your people and forget about him? Because that's the contrast we have here. Don Silva has forgotten about his people and he's going after his love. Faye Dalma, she's gone with the, the gypsy heritage. She's forgotten about the Spanish people that she, that she has been raised under. But she forgets about Don Silva. So Don Silva is clinging on to her and Faye Dalma just... Uh, you know, forget about what she thinks. <laughs> Again, thoroughly unrealistic. We're looking at metaphor. This is highly stylized. Well, what ends up happening is that the, do the, well, let's ask the question. Do the gypsy people accept Don Silva, the Spaniard? Well, they, ex they accept Faye Dalma as queen but as the gypsy queen, even though she is uh, raised as Spanish, do they accept Don Silva, the grunt, the guy who is clinging on to her as a betrothed husband? Well, he's sitting guard one day over the gypsy camp. Uh, he's guarding against the Spanish invasion. Fascinating. And as he's guarding one night, he overhears the gypsy tribe here called the Zincala or Zincali. He overhears them singing around the campfire and they're singing a song about him. Here's what they sing. Brother, hear and take the curse. Curse of souls and bodies throws. If you hate not all our foes, cling not fast to all our woes. Turn false, Zincalo. May you be accursed by hunger and by thirst, by spiked pangs, starvation's fangs, clutching you alone, when none but peering vultures hear you moan. Cursed by burning hands, cursed by arching brow, when on sea-wide sands fevers lay you low. Their song continues. Swear to hate the cruel cross, the silver cross, glittering, laughing at the blood shed below it in a flood. When it glitters over Moorish porches, 
laughing at the scent of flesh. When it glitters where the faggot scorches, burning life's mysterious mesh. Blood of wandering Israel, blood of wandering Ishmael, blood the drink of Christian scorn, blood of wanderers, sons of morn, uh, etc. So <laughs> all of, uh, and it continues. Uh, the song continues. Basically, Spanish guy, we see you there. You are fake. Turn false zincalo. Turn false zincalo. Um, yeah, they have no welcoming <laughs> message for Don Silva. What ends up happening is the priest of Bedmar, one of the lead inquisitors who has condemned the betrothal of Don Silva and Fedalma from the beginning. Um, he has prayed uh, that this marriage not go through because he knows that Fedalma is, it's not just marrying down, it's not marrying a heretic. Fedalma is not a heretic because she's not Catholic. A, a heretic is a Catholic who has accepted false beliefs. Fedalma is gypsy. She is other. And Don, uh, Father Isador uh, has a premonition and prays that this not happen. The irony, it, 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 the irony is that the, the prayer is answered, but it's answered in a way that the gypsies conquer or capture Bedmar, the Spanish town. Um, so when it's conquered, Father Isador is captured by Zarka, Fedalma's father, and is marched to the stake to be burned, um, which he is. He is killed. Don Silva sees this, freaks out, <laughs> and kills Zarka, um, making Fedalma the gypsy queen. Truly tragic, but it goes on to talk about how now Fedalma must lead, must lead the gypsies to Africa, to lead them to a place of their own, because they cannot mix. The Spanish, the Moors, the Jews, and the gypsies are simply other. They cannot mix. There's no uh, diversity is our strength here. Um, this is not going to be resolved until the gypsies just leave to their promised land in Africa. This epic poem ends with a dreamlike sequence. You know, it's kind of a, an epilogue where Fedalma is leading the characters away by, or the gypsies away by boat. And through the mist, as she's leaving the shore of southern Spain across the Straits of Gibraltar to Africa, she sees Don Silva standing there. What must Don Silva do? Well, she asks. Well, he says, I will try, I will go to Rome. Uh, I will go to be absolved, uh, to have my life washed into fitness for an offering. So he wants to go back to Rome to reclaim his, his Spanish heritage, his Catholic heritage. Fedalma. Fedalma accepts her fate to, to leave to Africa. She says, We must depart forever. We must walk apart until the end. Our marriage rite is our resolve that we will each be true to high allegiance, higher than our love. Our dear young love, its breath was happiness, but it had grown upon a larger life which tore its roots asunder. We rebelled, the larger life subdued us, yet we, are, yet we are wed, for we shall carry each the pressure deep of the other's soul. I soon shall leave the shore, the winds tonight will bear me far away. My lord, farewell. And then she kind of disappears into the mist. A dreamlike sequence, really. I mean, really, this whole epic poem is very dreamlike. It's very mysterious. Again, unrealistic situations are placed on these characters. Um, what does George Eliot think about, uh, let's say, 
um, the gypsies leading to their to their promised land? What does she think about choosing love over national or religious identity, anything like that? I think that George Eliot, I, I am of the opinion that she is trying to separate herself from any of these characters. I don't think she wants to identify her personal opinions, the opinion of the author, with any of these characters. And I think that for one reason, which is in this epic poem, that I really think stood out. I found it very interesting. We're going back to this character of Juan, this character who pops in and out of all of these characters' lives. He winds up in the bedchamber of Don Silva and talks to him. He's in the, the taverns to talk to the townspeople. Hell, he even winds up on the other side of the <laughs> gypsy encampment and is talking to Fedalma there. Uh, you know, how does he get to all these places? Well, he's the intermediary between the characters and the reader. Well, there's this really interesting um, scene that's kind of unrelated to the plot of this poem. It just so it sticks out a bit like a sore thumb. Let me see if I can find it here. But what happens is um, Juan is singing a love song to a young street performer. I can't find it right here. To a young street performer. Um, and here it is. Oh, no, that's not it. Well, anyway, she's... Juan is singing a love song to this young street performer who's, who's Pepita, that's her name. So Pepita is just bowled over by this beautiful song that Juan is singing. And she asks for a kiss and Juan gives her a kiss. And then Pepita says, Juan, do you love me? Do you really love me as you have sung in that song? And Juan says, no, I don't. And Pepita is taken aback. What? You just sang a beautiful love song to me. What do you mean you don't love me? Juan says, ah, the poet in me, the singer in me loves you. But that is the character of the singer. You asked me if Juan loves you. Well, Juan, who cares about Juan? That is me. That is not my role. My role in talking to all the people, all the characters in this poem, my role is to give other people a voice. Other people speak through me as the poet. Other people speak through me as the singer. They're not good at speaking for themselves. I'm a really good speaker. I'm a really good writer. I'm a very good poet. And I know how to speak for other people. I know how to do it poetically, fluently, and persuasively. I know how to speak for other people. So when I say I love you and I sing you a beautiful song, that's not me. That's somebody else. Go find that somebody else. But that's not me. That's a really interesting interchange that this character of Juan has with young Pepita. Because I think, and that's completely unrelated to the plot of this epic poem. And I lost my place mark, but nonetheless, it's, it's unrelated to what goes on uh, else in this epic poem. So why is it included? I think if any, if George Eliot has any uh, say, in, if, if she is going to identify with any of these characters, it is with Juan. She is just giving characters and people that are nothing like her. She's giving them a voice. And I think it's not just with the Spanish gypsy. She does that throughout her literary career, through all of her novels. She's giving people who cannot speak for themselves a voice, whether she actually sympathizes with them or not. Who cares what George Eliot thinks? She's here for the characters. I find that very powerful, and I find that really, really cool. I love that. The Spanish Gypsy, does it work? Is it, is it rightly forgotten about by a modern audience? Look, if you're looking for George Eliot to write pastoral, um, um, bucolic uh, stories from the English Midlands, this is not your thing. You're, you're, this is, you're not going to like this. Uh, but if you're looking for something challenging, 
something that I find personally rewarding because you're looking for a challenge. Um, yeah, this is it. I loved this. I'm going to read it again. I say that often with a lot of the stuff that George Eliot writes. I'll give it a year or two, but I'm going to return to it. Because there's a lot of stuff in here that I'm sure I missed. A lot of stuff. Anyway, that's the Spanish Gypsy. I've gone on at length a lot longer, but I think this deserves it. It's forgotten about, and I want to give it a little life, the life that I can. Anyway, we're going to be going now through... Uh, a lot of the portion that is remaining in George Eliot's career before we get to Middlemarch is going to be poetry. And it's not of this length. The Spanish Gypsy is by far the longest poem that George Eliot ever wrote. But there's more poetry to come, and I'm looking forward to it now. Anyway, if you made it this far, thank you for watching. We'll talk to you later.